Hello everyone, it's Chaplain April and I am doing this video because I have been absent for a couple months because um, I had told my editor that I really couldn't uh, continue doing videos for a little bit because I had my classes coming up and of course we had Christmas, we had, you know, all the holidays and it was just too much. So I took a break from YouTube. So what I've been doing is shorts. And so my, um, my editor has been posting shorts for me. He'll go into one of the videos that I've already done and then he will kind of um, take a little excerpt there and, and make it into a little short and that's been working really well. But obviously that's not new content. So I'm, I'm ready to do new content again it's been a crazy two months. Um, I didn't film at all when I was in Dallas. Well, I, I think I filmed a few small short things, but um, I had my boys with me at the Airbnb for the first week. So um, I didn't, I don't know. It was just, it was a weird week. Um, classes started on January 2nd. So that was a Tuesday, so we didn't really have a five-day week like we did last year. We didn't have class Monday, so we got to Dallas Monday, and then we had class Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, I didn't realize that's how it was going to be until our professor um, kind of changed the schedule on us. It was like two weeks prior, and so he said, you know, since you guys are pastors and whatever, um, I'm sure you don't want to have class Saturday because um, we were supposed to go Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday to get our full class in. So he was going to give us off Saturday and everyone was like, okay, and um, we're going to do some Zooms uh, to make up for that class time. And everybody was fine with it. Then he comes up with um, Friday. We're not going to have class Friday because um, we had to work on some or on a presentation. So he was giving us Friday off to work on a presentation. So literally, it was a three-day class, and uh, but it was eight hours of lecture nonstop. <laughs> so it was quite. Uh, it was it it was pretty intense. It was I will just say that it was intense. Uh, lecture nonstop for eight hours and um, in the middle of that we had another person drop out of our program so you know when the program started because you start with a cohort and they want you all together I think we had 10 people at the beginning um, the first week the first class somebody dropped out that was the other chaplain um, that was in the program with me there's a whole nother cohort in Houston where they're all chaplains and sometimes I think maybe I should have gone to that, but I don't know. So we lost her, and then over the summer, we lost um, this lady that I I was really happy to get to know and was going to try to get close to, and she's a Presbyterian pastor. She's transferring her program, so she's going to continue with her studies, but... Um, she lives, I think, in Indiana, and so there's a seminary somewhere in Chicago that she said she can just go there and transfer everything there. So we lost her, and then right before our second set of classes started, you know, in January, um, we another one of our cohort had said that she was putting hers on hold so she wants to continue but she's putting it on hold which means she won't be able to continue with us so whenever she gets back into the program she won't be with with our class anymore so we were all really like oh my gosh we lost three people and then during our first class which is called leadership vocation in church theology i don't know <laughs> the um there was all these weird things with the title because the title was real similar to one other class we had last summer and they kind of changed the title but didn't and anyway on day three of our lecture series that we were in another classmate didn't show and so I don't know why I was the elected person to check on her but I think because I had been talking to her the day before and so I said well let me just um, message because we have a little um a little chat in messenger with just all of our classmates so we can ask each other you know hey 
you know, what do you think about this or, or where are you at on your paper and that type of thing. So I checked on her and she messaged me back and she said, um, I mean, I'm not going to out all of her stuff that she said, but she something about a learning disability and she was just having a lot of trouble with all of these papers and she wasn't able to get it out. And she's a pastor. She actually pastors in a town in Oklahoma, like East, let's see, is it Eastern or Western Oklahoma? Western Oklahoma. Uh, she's a Methodist pastor. She is an orator. If you hear her speak, it's just, wow. I love how she speaks. But she said she's gifted with that, and then she can't get the words on the paper, and this whole long thing she told me. And I said, but we'll help you. You know, we'll be there for you and everything. And she said, well, I'm sorry. I've already withdrawn. So she withdrew. So now we have lost four four people out of our cohort so we are down to six people it's five women and one poor guy all by himself <laughs> so um he's a methodist minister in dallas and so it, it was just the six of us now so i am going to read the lectures that we went through i i filled up most of this um most of this legal pad, oh, you can't even see anything here. And I, I decided that's the last time I'm going to take handwritten notes because I was like writing, writing, writing. My hand would get cramp, a cramp in it. I would get tired and then I'm writing and I'm like, I have my computer right here and I just bought this new computer. It's a MacBook Air. My brother-in-law uh, gave me his discount or one of his discounts to, to get it. And, um, my, he may not be my brother-in-law anymore because they're my sister and he are getting divorced. Um, but he said he'll always be my brother anyway, so I, I know that. But anyway, um, so I have this new computer and I bought it so that I could um, use it for, you know, for my studies. It's going to help me a lot. It also helps me in the videos. I'm actually recording on my computer right now, which this is so easy. It's easier than like you know, um, trying to set things up and all of that. And then I can just get it straight to YouTube. Um, so this is an experiment I'm, I'm doing today with that. But so this computer has really been great because my other one, I had to get a new hard drive in it and everything, but I keep that one at work so that um, if I'm writing for a class or whatever, I can use Google Drive and then that saves everything. So you don't have to email your stuff back and forth. So I can just log into Google Drive at work and write, or I can log into Google Drive at home and write. And this is the computer I keep with me and that I'm using for school. So it's really been great. I mean, it's really been good. The only problem I had is that it didn't come with Microsoft Word on it, and I like Microsoft Word. And uh, so my first paper that I turned in um, the pre-class paper for this pr new professor that we had, um, the one that did the lecturing, that paper did not turn out so good. Um, I had a really, really jam-packed December, like everyone does, and but since I'm the only girl in the house, like I do everything. Like I was doing all of the Christmas cooking and baking and you know, putting up the tree and decorating and just on and on and on. Um, but we had all this pre-class work that was supposed to be due way before we met for class. Well, actually it was like the Thursday before. It was three days after Christmas. We had this paper due. And if you can imagine, because I don't have a whole lot of time off work, I was using all my time off work to for the classes. So I only had, I only was able to take like one day or something for Christmas um, and the same for Thanksgiving um, because I was saving everything up. And so I was trying to write at work. My supervisor knows that I do that and it's okay because it is a, um, it's related and I want, and I'm doing this to get board certified for chaplaincy. So they're okay with that. I mean, I'm not going to spend all day you know, writing at work, but I can spend time at work writing. So 
I was doing that, but it still just wasn't enough because sometimes I can't concentrate at work. I could have um, where my office is situated, where all the chaplains' offices are is this hallway where stuff is going by all day long and it's it can be noisy. Um, and then also because I'm the ICU chaplain, I'm always getting called out for stuff. So it's like, um, and during the holidays is when is when hospitals get crazy because people are, I don't know, people get, there's always, always a surge of health stuff during the holidays. So the hospital's full. And so we'll have, you know, we would have two and three codes a day. And then I would have maybe two comfort care things a day. And so I would have to like, I'd be writing and then I'd have to leave and come back. And it just wasn't ideal. And and the other thing is I shut down, so I wrote like half the paper, then I shut it down until after Christmas because I couldn't really focus. I was having to, you know, do all of that. And, and I came back to it. And so the professor, I this is the worst grade I've gotten so far in the program. It was a low B and that was the, the worst grade I've gotten. The worst grade before that was a high B that I got on one of my other papers. So I was really kind of devastated about that. You know, this is my thing. And it's like, I can't even write a paper and get a good grade on it. I was really upset. But what he told me is that the second part of the paper was disconnected from the first part of the paper, which makes a lot of sense because I wrote the first part and then I took a break for like a week and a half and then came back to it. So something happened there, but <clears throat> got it in got it done um, so let's go through these notes from this is our first class the leadership vocation in church and um, because I, I had promised that I was going to do this so last time for each class I did day one two three four five you know six seven eight nine but this time I'm just going to do week one and two because um, our second week wasn't really a whole lot of class work. There was no lecturing at all in the second week. So I have very, very little notes from second week. So we'll go through the first week and I don't know where my head is going to be at with all of these notes because I'm trying to remember all this. But our professor, this is the first time that he um, had ever taught um, in the in the doctoral program he teaches the uh, the seminary students the um, the the master of divinity students is what he normally teaches so um, we didn't get our syllabus until late I mean the whole thing it was just it was just a lot it was a, it was a marathon he's kind of a philosophy he's a theology professor but he brings in a lot of like philosophy and things like that so the lecture was kind of all over it was like we're trying to to remember and, and a lot of history a lot of like church history and how things kind of you know came together so that's what these notes are going to be about so the book that we had for that class oh shoot I don't even have the book it was anyway it's called I don't know what it's called, but <laughs> but it's about polarization in the church. So so this book was talking about how people are already polarized outside of the church as far as like their uh, in our in our beliefs in our uh, in our politics we're polarized, and so people bring that into the church, and so the church is kind of polarized also, and churches don't really want to address these things um you know the new thing is like avoidance let's just not talk about it and you know wherever you're at it's fine and you know but they're not going to talk about it from the pulpit <clears throat> and so the church we were going to does that they don't talk about politics at all and it's just kind of whatever so the book is like bringing christians into unity and whether whether they are on the same side of politics or not so that's what our first paper was so it was a little bit of a challenge for me because i don't know just just what we were writing about was not like something like really inspirational for me and i think that's why i struggled with that paper um, but the one that I just wrote, the post-class paper, was a 15 to 20 page, and oh, that was brutal. So that one, it was more inspiring. I'll tell you about that here at the end. But so let's just go through here. So politics has supplanted religion, is what he was telling us. 
So the world used to be mostly about religion. You know, when the Catholic Church was, you know, like the only thing to look to, it was involved, the Catholic Church was involved in politics and everything. And so it was all church, you know, it was kind of like, um, you know, back in England, back in the day, it was all about the Catholic Church and that was part of religion and everything. But then in the U.S., you know, the, the separation of church and state. And so then it all became separate. So religion is like outside of the church. So he's saying that um, religion used to be the big thing, but now politics has supplanted that. Everyone used to look to the church for direction and all of that. So now everyone kind of, I guess, looks to politics is kind of what he was saying. I hope I'm <laughs> telling you this right because this has been three weeks ago now that I took this class. What makes, well, this has a stain on it. I must have spilled. This thing is like been through the ringer because... When I wrote my paper, I needed to use a lot of these notes, and it's just been through the ringer here. So I can't read what's in that stain. What makes something different than simple partnership? And then, okay, so he talked a lot about penultimate politics. Okay, let's, let's move on because I can't read that. The structure of our civil life is polarized. Uh, we are sorting ourselves. The other side represents a total system we disagree with. What gives your ultimate values slash system? We always look to find proximate solutions to problems. Today's solutions are tomorrow's problems. History does not have complete solutions, just proximate ones. Um, and then Levin's... Um, descriptive project. So Levin is the um, author of the book. I don't know what I did with it. I think I still have some books in my car. I mean, I, I brought a lot of books here, but I missed a couple. They're still in there floating around in the back seat of the car. So where am I at here? History does not have complete solutions, just proximate ones. Levin's descriptive project, how to understand social context equals understanding vocation. Work of ministry related to our social context. Pay attention to the differences in our times. And then he starts talking about Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, social context is different than ours. What tools can we something to our time? This is really going great, isn't it? Good po politics is limited. Politics that does everything is totalitarianism. Politics manages conflict. No, polarization manages conflict. How do we transcend polarization itself? Uh, the structure of our society incentivized us to move in certain directions. Uh, polarization causes stability. So even though polarization is, you know, seen as not uh, not such a good thing, it actually causes stability because it causes people to, you know, have to agree to disagree. Who is supposed to be doing the listening? Then he talked about this circle of responsibility um, that everybody has. Everybody has a circle of responsibility. And then who is in that circle? Um, what is this for Levin, the, the author? Um, and the circle of responsibility, our spot, our response to God's actions on us. God is the initial agent. We are the responder to be held accountable. To take responsibility is different. Questions of violence in your context, out of the macro level to the micro level, what are we doing in common? Let's see. Our virtues is that of being correct equals patience. God lets history go on and it lets history go on. Vocation, God gives to everyone, not just anything. And then he goes into this Weber, which is written out Weber, but it's pronounced Weber. Um, and then politics as vocation. So he, he brings in all these different historical figure, figures. He'll go from that to Aristotle, and then he'll go to Karl Barth, and then, you know, on and just back and forth and brings them, kind of weaves them all together here. The emergence of modern politics, a natural human activity. Now he's bringing Aristotle. So now it's just gonna, it's just kind of like all over the place here. Not just natural, but constructive is how we build poli 
political structures. We meet a partial skill. We need a partial skill set for this to be our vocation. A politician in modern politics, not by ethics and ultimate goods, but I can't even read my writing here. And I've got this little, um, this little. Well, it's not really a diagram, but it says ethics, nonviolence up here, and then responsibility down here. I should have done this the day of because now I'm not remembering a whole lot, right? Okay, ultimate ends is not political. Faber is not a Christian. And he goes into the Sermon on the Mount, ethics of indignity. Nonviolence equals the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, yeah, nonviolence. Coercion, rejection of politics, ethics of responsibility. Um, states are modern forms of political order, um, a modern way of organizing. The states have a monopoly on the legitimate use of force or violence. The means of politics is to enforce law. And then ethics of responsibility means to be to help hold accountable. Um, and then ultimate ends, ethics of ultimate ends, the Christian does rightly and leaves the results with the Lord. So accountability equals predictable proximate consequences managing the system. The nature of of politics helps us understand the nature of leadership. Is there a way to be faithful to Christ and still be responsible? The social gospel, what would Jesus do? We will be able to eradicate evil. So that's something he went into that. I don't know. Reality, humans resist being engineered. And then Niebuhr, who is another um, author, he's always been his most vexing problem. Man has always been his most vexing problem is what Niebuhr said. So then we're going back to Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer becomes a pastor. He does two dissertations. He has a minor. He's a minor aristocrat. And then something about the Weimar Republic, emerging low-level form of democracy. Um, Bonhoeffer writes academic texts. He, he has a need to resist to over, the overtaking of the church by the Nazi regime. Um, so he starts a hidden seminary. He goes to prison. So Bonhoeffer, I mean, he's just kind of a hero of the faith. He, um, he was an intellectual, very, very smart guy uh, who, who's from Germany and grew up in a really amazing home with two intellectual parents. And so the guy becomes like a theolo theology prodigy. You know, he, um, where's the book that we had on him? Or I ordered a book on him. Yes, it's called, um, what is it called? I don't have those notes here. Anyway, he writes this amazing book. So what he felt is that, um, the church, so, so the Nazi, Nazi regime was, was getting bigger and bigger during his lifetime and he was resisting it. But what the most thing that he didn't want to happen was for the Nazi regime to take over the church because he thought that was the biggest travesty that could happen. Um, they're taking over everything, education and, you know, they, everything that you do now has to be under their watch. And so he was a resisting them taking over the church because that's not correct. You can't just tell us what to believe and how to believe, um, because you don't like what we're, you know, you don't like our beliefs and we're not going to like bow to Hitler, you know? And so... He goes to prison because of that. And then he says, Christ commands are not meant to be questioned. So there's this idea of simple obedience and what is the will of God in the midst of what is going on. So simple obedience is a thing in theology. Then he goes back to Weber. Okay, so yeah, so Weber is a sociologist. So he brings in, so, so our professor brings in sociology, he brings in philosophy, you know, all these things. Um, Aristotle says we are political animals. Uh, okay, and then Bonhoeffer again. There are other forms of relationships that require responsibility. So then he brings in Martin Luther because Bonhoeffer was greatly um, influenced by Martin Luther. I mean, how can you not be? So Bonhoeffer becomes a Lutheran pastor. So Martin Luther used to be, you know, Catholic and I think he was a priest. And then um, because he came up with the 95 Theses and he re was resisting what the church was doing during those times, um, 
they were selling indulgences and just the church was corrupt at the time so it's not really the catholicism that was bad it was what the church was doing with what they had been given and they were it was it was corrupt so that's what martin luther was protesting that's what he protested with the 95 theses that he nailed up on the door of the church at Wittenberg you know so um, Martin Luther's always been a hero of mine I I love Martin Luther that was a little hard to say I can't really say that in uh couldn't really say that in class because our professor's Episcopal he used to be well, I guess it's still Protestant but anyway it's just it's a little convoluted there but so Martin Luther is suspicious of self-justification. No, Bonhoeffer's suspicious of self-justification. The standard of ethics is one that God set for himself. God has not set the world to your flourishing, Bonhoeffer's belief. It's impossible to know the will of God. So this is what all these different guys think. So we have to know what all of these different people think or thought during the time so as to know what was going on during that time and how it has progressed to what where we are today um not a strict consequentialist argument between right and right and wrong and wrong um there's a epistemological point about how you know things <sighs> example father's responsibility to his children Karl Barth doctrine of the mandates luther believes in the orders of creation so i have that here we've got family god church economics and culture so then bonhoeffer changes these orders that luther did to orders of preservation so luther called them orders of creation bonhoeffer changes it to order of preservation um ways god has put together to preserve our existence we only have underpinnings if they underpinnings okay if the government doesn't do what it's supposed to do it is no longer justified act of ordering constantly required politics is not ordered but or ordering then no longer uses the word order but mandate so now they are not the orders they are the mandates um directly commanded by god so he's talking about this book called Imagine Communities. Uh, morality is self-evident. Any mandate can become destructive. Uh, each should flourish within their own domain and not take from the others. This would be, yes, I really needed to do this the day of because there was a lot packed in there. When he goes from these different philosophers to sociology to this, it's just like, oh my Another god. Caller. I don't even know how I can, like follow this so Bonhoeffer's drawing on Luther um, we don't always have to be revolutionaries so he is talking about how in America everyone's a revolutionary well if they don't this and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna change that and da -da -da. and he's saying we don't have to do that so he opposes he's opposed to Anabaptism way of thinking uh, of putting Bible any situation okay these are socially constructed mandates proximate foreseeable contingencies consequences proximate foreseeable consequences so then he brings in this however was however was i don't remember that influential christian ethicist um it talks about the peaceable peaceable kingdom and christian pacifism lord help us what is the theological defense for responsibility um, responsibility is only possible on completely devoting one's own life to another person. Christ is the only ultimately responsible person. He has none of the relationships. He is free for everyone. The ability to act on behalf of another in their place. Christ is different. He is the man for others. Responsibility is the nature or disposition needed to exercise your vocation. Whatever you're given to do, do it to the best of your ability. That's, I think, a verse. Um, our responsibilities constrain us. So he's linking responsibility to vocation. So everyone that has a vocation that is in the ministry is 
feeling like that responsibility, right? Okay. Where, whatever you're given to do, do the best of your ability. Um, the problems that come to us, we do in our world what Christ does for the world as a whole. Um, there are spaces for us to overcome politi political stuff. Loving. Um, then he goes into Augustine. Um, have this is why I do not need to be doing handwritten notes. I should just be typing it on my computer, <laughs> get in the note app or somewhere and type it because I, I can't even read this. I'm just trying to write too fast. Um, and then it's not making sense. Okay, Augustine, have care of your being, something that you love, love of self or God. You don't know which one you are. I hope in Galatians, what's the matter, baby? What happened? What's wrong? What are you meowing about? What happened? Oh my goodness. You can't go out there right now. Oh, look at you. What's the matter? You can't get out there. What is Luther's main contribution to these themes? Is it different than Bonhoeffer's? I don't know, because I'm not remembering a whole lot here. <laughs> okay. Um, just talks about some video. Da, 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 love and virtue of elusiveness. And now we're going to do Martin Luther. So consequentialism is a form of ethical reasoning. Bonhoeffer talks about the ultimate is justification of the sinner. Why are you trying to get out there right now? No, you're not going to be happy out there. You're not going to like it out there in the mud. No, that's not going to be good. So then he puts ultimate goods against penultimate good. God and Jesus Christ is Lord. And then on the penultimate side, he has pretending and usurping. So God shouldn't be taking over the process of the word no the government shouldn't be taking over the process of the word bonhoeffer talks about justification of the sinner um christ righteousness is impeded to us um and defending the word is paramount so yes so bonhoeffer the reason he didn't want the nazis to um take over the church is because you can't change the word of god so to him, defending the word was was paramount, and he was going to give his life. He was going to die if he had to, to protect the word of God, and thank God for that, right? Um, the church tries to be elusive as a solution to polarization. So once we, we wrote our papers, and we read this book and everything, that was what was in the book. So So the solution to polarization was to be elusive. How does the Christian tradition give us tools in our current context? How do we love each other? It is complex. What does it mean to love? Niceness will lose. Okay, and then he goes into Taylor. God loveth adverbs. Oh, that was a article that we read. We didn't go into it a whole lot. And he talks about Karl Barth was reformed, reformed theology. Um, God See, I can't even read this. God. Okay, Bonhoeffer shares a great deal with Bart. Um, the orders of preservation. God meets us in our form of life. Uh, mandate. Okay, Taylor. Contemplative life. Give ourselves over to our common tasks. So contemplation used to be the way that Christians could serve God. It wasn't like, it, it was like, if you wanted to serve God, you went into the monastic life. You went into, you became a priest or a nun or, you know, you, you, you became, um, you, that's how you did it. it. It was like apart from normal life. So this is talking about bringing all of that into normal life. That's what, um, the priesthood of all believers is. So the priesthood of all believers is Luther, Martin Luther, um, telling us that, you know, this conviction that he had in his heart, he was a priest. And then when he saw all the corruption in the church, he tried to change it, you know, and brought in Protestantism. And then he stopped being a priest and, and got married. So this is how deeply he believed this, that um, the priesthood of all believers is that Jesus um, is our priest and our high priest and our mediator. So 
What a priest does is he mediates between the regular layperson and God. But Martin Luther is saying that we don't need that because after Jesus Christ came, we needed it obviously in the Old Testament, but after Jesus Christ died and everything, now he's our priest and so we can go straight to him. We can go straight to Jesus Christ. We can go straight to God the Father through Jesus Christ. And that's what a priest does for us so that we now can have the priesthood of all believers. So contemplation outranks the goods, um, active versus contemplative life. So so we're, we're coming from contemplative life to now bringing this into active life, you know, normal life. You can, you can have a vocation for this now. So, okay, so religious vocation is different. Renouncing ordinary things, everyone can meet God in their everyday life. And then Aristotle, do active life to get to contemplation. Whatever you have to do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. And then calling is another word for vocation. God cares not how good, but how well. Um, and then Protestant Reformation, call back into the world. So yes, so we're called back into the world with the Reformation. We're called back from priests and nuns and contemplative life, monastic life to the world. So we are mediating grace. We are responsible for the word and sacrament. And this has a page number. I'm not sure what, I think this is the book. God created us to labor in some way. God gave him a task immediately. So he gave man a task immediately. So we're to labor in some way. So, you know, if we want to choose that to be our vocation, something that God has for us or something that seems like a religious type thing is what he's talking about here. So we're doing our work to honor God and to contribute to the welfare of other humans. Humans serve God's purposes. And then he brings in sanctification. <clears throat> so sanctification of the ordinary. God meets us in the activity. Um, the life you say may be your own. The life you the life you say may be your own. I don't know what that's about. Taylor's thesis works out by mutation of sanctification of ordinary life. And then I talked about the deists, um, which is, you know, most of the guys that helped put our country together were deists. Um, it becomes now its own just, ordin ordinary life becomes its own justification. So that's what we're talking about up here, justification of the, do you hear him meowing every two seconds? He's meowing. He keeps meowing. I, well, he wants to go in your room. Oh, he was in my room. But he wanted to go. He wants to go outside really bad. I he think. Wants to go outside. He always wants to go out through the door or the window. Okay, so my son informed me that he's going to be making a salad and maybe making noise over here. So, I might hear him chopping stuff. <laughs> oh gosh, this is my life. What can I say? Okay, where was I at here? God created us to labor in some way. Um, God gave man a task immediately. So we are doing work to honor God and contribute to the welfare of other humans. Humans serve God's purposes. And then sanctification of the ordinary. God meets us in the activity. Taylor's thesis. Okay, the deists. It becomes now its own justification in order to God or not. Being a better version of yourself, um, not necessarily offering your life to God, we become objects of our activity. We value productivity. Um, the Protestant Reformation and scientific evolution intertwine. Now we trust only in our own rationality. God is not interacting in, in history. That's a deistic view. Um, putting rational tools to work on humans. We need ethics of responsibility. How is a Christian free and bound at the same time? Luther. In modernity develops a part form of apology. Current equals polarized. Okay, not sure what's going going on here responsibility in every day proximate consequences the light of reason has come to the dark days of tradition 
Doctrine and Providence, the Doctrine of Assurance. Okay, so scientific revolution swings free of theological underpinnings. We need to have a grasp of where we are and how we get here. Reading, bearing the burden of the world. Luther could not get to feel assurance of his salvation, which that was really crazy to hear. Um, there's a pedagogical tool. Good acts are meritorious. And then we're talking about our final paper. Luther only puts just Justification by faith can renew a only justification by faith can renew a person in the soul. Our freedom is secure internally from works. The soul has been set free from sin, interior freedom. Activities of the soul are still bound by all nature. Nothing but the word of God satisfies the soul. Um, the renewal of the soul by the word of God, individual relationship with God. And then the scientific revolution brings in reason, the political liberal. And then up here he says, you do it for yourself. Bonhoeffer, what is the will of God? That's what he was asking. In what way is Christian dutiful to all and subject to none? And how do they hold that together? So dutiful is taking care of the body, spiritual disciplines, using the body to grow, spiritual attending to the disciplines, strengthening ourselves to care for one another like Christ did for us and by gracious mercy. Three camps of moral theology. We have moral theory, deontology, teleology, and virtue. He went through all of those. Oh, here we go. He's going to start me on again. Bonhoeffer writes letters and papers from prison. Um, and he actually has a book on that too. Um, the baptism, okay, he baptizes his godson. Parts of Christian ministry remain stable. Then he has, we talk about Luther, and then the nation, the, the, the church, and then polarization. America is now post-denominational. There's a volatility in the stability. How do we transcend polarization? That's what we were asking before, wasn't it? We receive with gratitude the pieces from uh, in other institutional savvy. Okay, so now we go to Augustine. Peace equals peace is ultimate. What is Christian interpretation of leadership? Christian will think biblically. The goal of politics... Rome was mad at Christian. Christians are the best citizens because they don't value earthly citizenship as the ultimate. What's required to do this? The virtues of political... Okay. Describe the mandates. Blah, blah. Oh my god, we're going to be here all day with all, with these notes. This is January 18th. There, we did a group Zoom. Okay, now we're on Augustine. Elstein articles. Those are some articles we read. Think with Augustine in our time. Evil as a privation. Evil is... Uh, uh, uh. God is goodness and existence. Being and goodness are the same. God's will and reason are identical. We are given back to the fragments of ourselves in our salvation. We are given back the fragments of ourselves. Our desires need to be repaired. Divine simplicity was a problem. Oh, you think you want to go out there, don't ya? Here we go. Perfect being, not dependent on anything else but the creator. God is the source of all of this. Evil has no existence. I was really happy. This is towards the end of the class. But I mean, he just lectured for three days, like eight hours of lecture, nonstop lecture. And so I think this is why my notes are all over the place because it was just like, whoa. Um, but and then he went into evil. And so evil has no existence is the absence of and dis diminishment of good. So it, it, it is a diminution of being the absence of being good. Evil doesn't have an existence. It's not a thing. It's the name that we give to privation of flourishing. Wow. So I'm going to use that in my evil, my, my video on evil. Doing evil is taking away from someone's humanness. So evil is nothingness. The, it's, sin is the activity that chooses us. Not flourishing as humans themselves, we become habituated into choosing. Non-moral evils equals hurricane. Everything has a perfection that it should attain. 
um, Augustine's Metaphysics, and then Elstein, evil has no root. It's always an emptiness. Not how big and bad it is, but how empty it is. You cannot eradicate it. You cannot eradicate evil. You do away with things that are evil or people that are evil, but you cannot eradicate evil. So Jesus is going to do that, right? So kings and priests and Jews and history... Evil is not a thing. It is not a category of existence. There are evil doers. Um, common, let's see, political authority, city of God. That's something that Augustine wrote. It is an apology for Christians in Rome. Um, that is not their fault. Augustine, our citizenship in hev is in heaven and makes us the best possible citizens on earth. We worship the one God. It frees us to be with God in everything except your falsehoods. You are constituted by falsehood. As Christians, we build up the city and make it better. We live in this world in its brokenness. Having authority, you have to make choices. You have to make choices you wish you didn't. We have to take the world as it comes to us. Living in a broken world, doing what you can to mend it without being able to mend it fully. That is what we are tasked with. So he's talking about God is going to separate the wheat from the tares and blah, blah, blah. At our core, we are citizens of God or of man. One fundament, fundamental thing, either God or ourselves. So God sorts us in the end, the wheat and the tares, both cities moving through time together. So it's the city of God and the city of man. That's what Augustine wrote about. So those two cities are moving through time together. Don't try to read those. Those are craziness. I mean, those are rough to get through. Uh, all the places are wrong instead of all the wrong places. Our hearts are restless until we find our rest in thee. The church is distinct from the city of God. Um, the church is on a pilgrimage through the world as an instrument of peacemaking, mediating God, grace in the sacrament. Um, then talk about the doctrine of assurance, sacraments. God promises to meet us and they bring grace. God is faithful to keep his divine promises. Um, the city of God, what Augustine wrote, shapes Western tradition politically and etc. Working in history, not making it turn out right. Augustine says we can love the world in its brokenness. Uh, okay, Bridwell Library, he talks about our library. We are resisting evil doing. Human happiness cannot be achieved in this life. Our life deeply enmeshed in evil and subject to decay. Con conflicting wills. Our human life is beset by suffering. Genuine justice gives each his due. Christians um, leaven the world with justice. Virtue is acquired. Um, we are fragmented, broken creatures. Vices versus virtues. Our need to acquire virtue is because of our brokenness. Perpetual lifelong work of ordering ourselves. There's a war against our vices and our virtues shape us. The misuse of social life. Vice is resisted. Virtue is constantly warring against our vices. We are creatures who are given to deficiency and excess. We see our brokenness. So then Augustine has the doctrine of original sin. We come into the world broken. Overcomes... Plagianism. Da, da, da. You need to fix yourself. What you need is grace. You can't fix yourself. The tasks we are given don't come with perfect tools. Um, Bonhoeffer is willing to give his life for more perfect justice. The world is a problem that resists being fixed, but we can take responsibility to bring some justice, I think. Your existence is good. Creation is not a mistake. Our brokenness does not take away our good. Our brokenness is in our will. That's where our brokenness is. I'm on January 4th. So, second, this is the last day. Oh, this is the last page. Okay, Augustine, my desires are disordered. There's a corruption of the will. That's what needs to be repaired. The will needs to be freed to love. Augustine says you are free from the wrong desire to will what God wills. The object of God's special effect, affection is what humans are. We are the object of God's special affection 
and what separates us from the animals. He was talking about how the priest had to hand over the holy books to be burned. That's where the word traitor comes from. It's trattatore in Latin, I think. The holiness of the person does not bring about the grace of the sacrament. So grace upon grace. Evil is the absence of virtue or good, but is your will that is the problem. Our wills are broken. The fall is a secondary fall because the fall of the angels first, right? So the devil brings evil in temptation. God is not the author of evil. Evil is a turning away from God. What does it profit you to gain the whole world and lose your soul? It's the last page of notes. And now we go to our second class, which was... It was about in Christian social innovation and building a people of power. So it's talking about um, innovating things in, in the world that are broken. So we each had to do these long presentations. We had to do an hour presentation. So our, our teacher, our professor there was an, um, a female and she had we only had to do like three or four hours of class class time and then she would let us have the afternoons to work on these hour-long presentations we had to do so uh, there's very little notes on this this is just things from the book um so it's it's called the the class is called models of leadership and in social institutions so the big thing for her was this thing called the pastoral circle and um you ask questions and that's just just a way that you can write something you do an analysis a reflection and then a response you do and um, you do immersion analysis reflection and response that's the pastoral circle and so our our presentations were on the pastoral circle where we had to use that for our presentations so and then social social innovation and entrepreneurship so it was all about social service organizations and things like that and alternative churches that people are not really um, liking to congregate anymore that's like a it's like from the 1950s until I forget what the year was it was it was an age of the church I'm not really sure what it was called it has a name but that we're not in that age anymore we're in a different age of the church where people don't like to be in the church like they used to because people everyone everyone used to be in the church so that's where you would go to meet people and do business and all that kind of stuff but now all of that is outside of the church it's just this whole concept so um so then she just talks about our project and what we decided to do was a yeah i only have two pages here so i'm not going to read all of this um our group so we had we had two um, uh, Masters of Divinity students in that class. So we actually had eight people, which was good. No, we had three. So we had nine people in that class. And so it really wasn't a lecturing. It was more every day she had it structured where we would do like group interactions and stuff like that. And we would all talk. So it wasn't like the first class was just lecture that class. And so, and then our project was to take something um, in the from the world that is broken and see how the church can do social innovation. So my group, we picked homelessness, and another group picked, um, gosh, what was it? I can't remember now. There were four four groups, and our projects ended up being more than an hour. So well, I only had three people in my group, and it was... It was kind of crazy. One of the uh, one of the girls ended up leaving every day early, and so it was just me and this other girl trying to put the whole project together. But it came together in the end, and I learned a lot about homelessness, and I'm really uh, interested in trying to do some sort of change in homelessness. And in our project, our presentation, I found out through my research that Finland has almost eradicated homelessness. And so this was part of our presentation that Finland has taken this uh, concept called, 
oh, is it housing first? I forgot the name of it, but the concept is is that you you put people in housing first and then they can reform. So instead of the way we do it here, but anyways, this whole thing, and so that was really cool. And then my last paper I used, I did on Catherine of Siena, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and Martin Luther.